be great. All right, oh, just get us back to the first slide, if you would. Oh, actually, no, this is the first slide. <laughs> I didn't recognize it. So we are actually using the Zoom closed captions uh, because they work really well. Um, so here's some information about how to do that. Olivia, if you just want to talk people through this. Yep, so uh, the, ca the caption should automatically uh, pop up at the bottom of your page. But if you want a more like clear transcript of everyone who's speaking, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and click show full transcript. Uh, and then it'll pop up on a sidebar and it'll have the entire transcript of everything that's being said. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. And with that, we want to go to the next slide. Now that people have the closed captions if they want them. All right, so uh, welcome everybody. As you know, we are here to on the topic of advancing the science on recovery community centers as funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. This is the steering committee who meets together and puts the, the seminars together and that's the pilot started funding and various other initiatives. You all have a link, I think, to the website with all the information. So we are funding for pilot studies, for traveling, if you are presenting on RCCs and so forth. Thank you, next slide. We do always have a poll to see who's in the room because we really do hope that we have all the different stakeholder groups talk to each other in this space that we create in these seminars. Here is who we typically have had in the past and we are about to do a poll where we're gonna ask you all who you are from. Next slide. We are focusing on recovery community centers here. There's also a lot of research done on other recovery support services. We are just including this slide here for your perusal later about other opportunities that exist in a larger network. If you have any questions about any of it, please reach out to us or directly to the people who are doing it. We just want to make sure you have this information. Next slide, please. All right, you can see I'm rushing because we have a really cool presentation for you all today and we really want to get your feedback. And grounding us all today in RCC's What is a Recovery Community Center, we have here Felicia Pullen, who's the founder and CEO of Pillars Holistic Recovery Support. And she's going to share with us what it is, what happens when you walk through the doors of her RCC. Felicia, over to you. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to do this. Somebody wants me really badly and I don't know how to silence my phone. Um, so I apologize for that. It's going through my Google Voice, I apologize. So what is it like coming through the doors of the pillars? Um, it's an opportunity to immediately feel love and support. Um, one thing about the pillars and one of the strengths of the pillars is that not only am I um, a woman in recovery, but most of the people who are employed by us are also either a family member or a um, individual in recovery themselves. And so we come from a place of compassion and understanding. And it's about receiving holistic practices. It's complementary and alternative forms of medicine, yoga, meditation, acupuncture, Reiki, but we really also look at the whole person. We understand that there are also health and wealth gaps that are prevalent in black and brown communities. And so we offer free medical appointments. We have workforce development. We have parenting skills enhancement classes. We have a clothing closet and we offer food for those that may be um, clothing and or food insecure. And so coming through the doors of the pillars is an opportunity to have the whole self um, loved and supported and we offer opportunities for development in all of those areas. And then finally, we do some community-based uh, initiatives and work. And what that looks like is information dissemination. We are about to embark on a mural uh, program on 125th Street that is led by young people talking about their perspectives of social justice. And so it's about community engagement, family engagement, individual engagement, and then supporting people in different aspects of, of society as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Felicia. And I, I love that you have that uh, young people event happening soon. We, we've, we've highlighted before how they, how they really engage in RCCs, and it's lovely to hear that here. Thank you. Great. And we'll hear from Felicia after our presentation again. For now, we're going to move over to our poll, I believe. Right, Olivia? All right, if you want to go over the next slide here. 
So if you can just complete these polling questions, um, they are the same as you usually have seen about which stakeholder group you are from. And then we only have one question that kind of starts getting us into today's topic. I'll give you a moment to scroll through here and complete this. And when you are done, just hit the blue submit button. And when we reach 80% of all people having completed it, Olivia will tell us. Okay, we just hit 80. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. If you want to share the polling results, I think everybody gets to scroll through it on their own screen. So jumping us down to the question that's going to set up Roxanne's talk in just a moment, we had asked the question of regarding taking medications for opioid use disorder, I believe most recovery community centers do which one of the following? And by far the biggest response is embrace the taking of medications for opioid use disorder as a valid pathway. Nobody believes that RCCs require them and very few th are worried about RCCs frowning upon people who choose to take medications for opioid use disorder. This is a great setup for, um, for Roxanne to, to get into her talk. I think we do have one other slide before we do, if you can advance us, Olivia. So as you know, we did a nationwide survey of RCCs where we were able to get feedback from 122 RCCs in the nation. And this is sort of what uh, the, the results that we got there about what RCCs do regarding medications for opioid use disorder. And we shared this before, which is just a reminder, and we have a recording and slides on this link. But back then we had found that the majority of RCCs are extremely open to medications assisted recovery. And a majority, 77%, provide direct support for medications for opioid use disorder. So this is what it looks like on the grand scale, on a reporting scale. Um, and Roxanne was actually able to talk to people and share what she found. So if you can go to the next slide for us, Olivia. We have here Mifas, um, Roxanne Newman from Brown University School of Public Health and her co-investigator, Alexandra Collins, I believe is also in the room. And Roxanne is gonna to present to us about the pilot study they have conducted and the findings that they have found. After she has presented, we have uh, several uh, folks from different stakeholder groups providing their thoughts and uh, comments on what, Alexa what Roxanne has found here. And then we invite you all to share your thoughts as well. And you can also certainly chime in with questions throughout the presentation, the hour. So over to you, Roxanne. Thank you for being here and sharing your results with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, first, I just want to say out loud that I am like extremely nervous. Um, it's always an honor and nerve wracking to present in front of colleagues, um, friends, peers, and people that I admire, look up to, um, my community. Um, when I say that my brain has been screaming, why did you get yourself into this for the last like two days? It's definitely been a lot of chatter, but um, I love it. I love doing this. I love talking about it. I love talking about recovery. So here we are in let's roll, right? So um, the title was of our study is an examination into the use of recovery community centers by people on MOUD. So myself, Catherine Dunham, and Alexander Collins um, were on this study, led this study. Next slide, please. So what we know from previous research is that engagement with recovery community centers, RCCs, um, is super important and linked to positive health outcomes. Increased recovery capital, Reductions in substance use, there's quality of life improvements, there's resources being used, people feel belonged, they feel part of a community. But despite these benefits, um, in Rhode Island, because this is where our sample comes from, 
there is data that shows that there, even though there's a, you know, the amount of people that are using RCCs is, is, is pretty significant. The amount of people that are on MOUD or at least being willing to disclose that they're on MOUD is substantially lower. So we need, we thought that it would be a good idea to look into this and see what's going on. Next slide, please. Please. Um, so the overarching aim, we were looking at RCC use by people on MOUD, looking at the barriers and facilitators, and really kind of getting this more in-depth, rich understanding of how people feel. Like, so we know quantitative research gets this more like um, overview of what's going on, where qualitative research gets right in, right into the nitty gritty, wants to hear it from people, wants to understand how people are feeling. Um, we got 2020 qualitative interviews conducted between January and July. And basically we got three groups of people, people who previously used RCCs, people who are currently using RCCs and people who are no longer using RCCs. Um, and we recruited them through RCCs, flyering and some online recruitment. We also got um, some demographic information uh, pertaining to obviously the usuals, right? Gender, um, education, we got um, understanding what type of substances they use, how long they've been in recovery. Next slide, please. And this is our demographic information. Um, pretty 50-50 on gender. Unfortunately, we did not um, recruit anyone who was from the other um, gender, from across the gender spectrum. And a limitation of our study, which um, we bring up in another slide is this is predominantly white. Um, even though our best efforts, we ran into this again, this problem that goes on in research where we have a, have a hard time recruiting from, um, or understanding how to recruit, I should say, um, from the minority, from groups, from minority groups. Um, we got pretty decent sample of people who came, who previously use it, but no longer using it and who are using RCCs, but there are a few that didn't understand, had never used an RCC or maybe had not even heard of one. And we divided the length of recovery into what the researchers pointed out was the three um, phases, which would be early recovery, which is less than a year, stable recovery, which is one to five years and sustained recovery, which is greater than five. Next slide, please. And these are our results. Um, so most common referral source came from inpatient treatment facilities, friends, peers in recovery, and family. Um, not really, you know, that makes sense, right? If you're in recovery and you want to know how to recover, where to go for recovery, you find out from people who are in recovery or, or in the treatment facilities, the people that are working in the field. What I was most shocked by was that only two participants reported hurting about RCCs via the methadone clinic, considering uh, a large portion of our participants were on methadone and therefore go to a clinic. I had thought maybe they had heard more with one participant saying they had heard di directly from a clinician at the clinic and another one saying that there had been flyers. Um, we asked who um, people think that RCCs are created for. Overwhelmingly, the amount said help for people with substance use problems. There was a large concentration, uh, large concentration on resources. If you need computers, if you need employment assistance, there's meetings, there's peer recovery specialists. Um, and a few people, which I found to be interesting, um, really honed in on people who don't have any resources, people who are of lower SES status, who don't have any family, who don't have any help. They really thought that RCCs are created for them. Next slide, please. And this is a direct quote from one of our participants, um, which I thought really kind of captured that idea that people are were understanding, or at least these participants were understanding that it was about, if you don't have a lot of money, then there's no need to go here. This is really for the people who need resources um, as far as in, like employment, housing, clothing, food, um, stuff like that. Next slide, please. Um, but, you know, we, we found that people did find it positive. They felt like it was welcoming. They could go in, um, but they didn't feel judged. They really highlighted, which we know, the importance of having staff with lived experience. Um, and I know Felicia, you know, talked about that, like walking in and knowing, like, um, there's really, 
and I'm a person in long-term recovery, it's really, there's nothing like being able to go in with your own people and like immediately know that you're in a space that like people really understand, really understand what you're going through, understand why you think the way you think, understand why you continue to maybe do the things you do and understand what type of struggle it's going to take to be able to get out of the situation that you're in. Next slide, please. Um, so part of the thing we wanted, we wanted to look at is what was going on in transition and use. Why were people using them and then no longer using them? And one of the things that really stood out was this um, quote here where the participant is talking about, you know, they used it, they used the recovery center, but now they're able to kind of advocate for themselves. They have resources. So they really didn't find that there was any more use for RCCs. Um, I had a, one participant, a woman who talked about, you know, which is like a soft spot for me, like she became a mom, like moms have to take care of their kids. They are tasked with taking care of children and don't have the ability to go to these functions and do these things. Or another participant talked about working. Like I know in Rhode Island, a lot of the RCC shut down at four as far as the operational part of it. There might be meetings going on later on in the night, but as far as that operational part where the recovery coaches are, um, people are going to work. They're not able to engage in RCC use because of, of that. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the other really big themes that we, we found was the intersection of MOUD, RCCs, and 12-step fellowship. Um, the RCCs themselves, the participants really um, communicated that they felt welcomed, um, but that they would walk in to some of the RCCs and let's say they would be like an AA or an NA meeting going on, which um, those of you know that um, AA and NA is, uh, is very uh, absence-based. And so they felt like they would walk in and they would get some stigma or they really understood RCs to be like some one participant said, like, it's the, you know, it's like the AA space, like it's this place they go and there's the meeting. So they really fused these two um, components together, RCCs and 12 step fellowship, which also um, kind of might have been the impetus for a while. There's selective disclosure about while pe about if people are on MOUD or not. Next slide, please. And these are some of the um, quotes um, from our participants that we thought really captured this understanding of what's going on between this intersection between RCCs and 12-step fellowships. Like the third one said, like this is an AA place, really connecting those two together. Um, next slide, please. So overall, you know, participants really did report positive experiences. Um, there was a lot of highlighting the social connection. Uh, there was my last, our last participant spoke about a Halloween party and how it was really their first time they went. Uh, they were in an all women's treatment facility. They went and it was really one of the first times they ever like had fun, like in recovery and they really loved it. Um, and being able to talk to others that understand, um, obviously resources, huge employment assistance, being able to use computers, different types of meetings. Um, but one of the things I think that we really wanted to th think about was in relation to the intersection between it, RCCs and 12 step fellowships was like, how can RCCs effectively support all pathways to recovery when there's competing ideologies between the pathways? We have one, you know, the RCC is stating we, we welcome all pathways, but when there's another path and within that, there's a pathway that's abstinence-based, which might make people pe who are on MOUD feel alienated and not part of. Um, next slide, please. Again, um, we only recruited from our state, Rhode Island. For those of you who don't know about Rhode Island, we're really small, which has its positive and its negatives. One of the positive, well, you know, if you want longitudinal study, this is a place to go because participants are not leaving. They're hanging out in Rhode Island. Um, but also, uh, you know, it's small. So you can only get a limited idea of what's going on really um, with RCCs in the way that Rhode Island works, very highly um, political influence. So there's some of that going on in here. And again, obviously a primarily white sample. Um, we felt that 
future research obviously should you know examine more racial and gender diverse samples um, I would like to, we'd like to see maybe the staff's perception of how people on MOUD are received and how they feel and how RCCs and ways to modify RCC programming, ways to set up the environment where people on MOUD feel even more accepted regardless of their recovery pathway. Next slide, please. Um, and so I, first of all, I just want to say thank you to my, to our participants. It's incredibly difficult to talk about recovery. It's incredibly difficult. The layers that come with talking about being in recovery, being uh, in recovery period, having substance use disorder, highly stigmatized. If you're a woman, you know, if you're an IV drug user, if you're on MOUD, if you've lost your children, if you've been to prison, like a lot of these things come in, participants come and they sit with me and they would cry and they would open up. And I felt really honored to be able to hear their story. Like I feel when I hear anyone's story, really about anyone's struggle doesn't need to be substance use. So I really am grateful for that. The community stakeholders, I worked with various RCCs. Um, you know, this is my community in Rhode Island. I love them. They open up themselves and they trust their people with me. And um, I'm just really honored to have that trust. Um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse via the Recovery Research Institute, really, really grateful for the funding. And I'd just like to thank my team too, Dr. Collins, Alex, um, she was transitioning, I want to say to assistant professor while I, she was mentoring me and I could tell that she was totally overwhelmed by having to like do all the things that come with that. And she's still stuck by me, Catherine, for helping me bang out this analysis, uh, Dr. John Sosky and Dr. Uh, Brandon Bergman were right by my side every step of the way. They helped me when I said maybe I should apply. Um, I would very um, periodically like text both of them and be like, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> and they were always there to support me and be like, you can do this, you can keep going. Um, so I'm just like really incredibly grateful because it's a team effort. So thank you. I should unmute myself. Thank you, Roxanne. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. <laughs> So what we have done here is we have asked uh, three people to provide uh, some thoughts and feedback to Roxanne on her study, as well as for all of us to contextualize about how does, what did we learn for this study and how does that mesh up with their own experiences in this space. So these are our three discussions and Felicia Pullen is going to go first to, to tell us your reactions to this research recommendations you have and how that fits in with what you see. Yeah, first I want to say, um, great job, Roxanne. I know that it must have been a little nail biting, but you knocked it out of the park. So congratulations. Um, and as I was beginning to look at the strengths, a lot of what we're seeing on the ground, I definitely saw in some of your findings and some of your slides, right? Um, and what I thought was really brilliant about what you did was you looked across the spectrum of people who had current and past um, use of RCCs and those on MOUD. So it wasn't just the people who were participating and who are currently participating, it's those who had some participation and may have stopped. And I think that that was really key in, in the work that you did. Um, and the other thing that I really appreciated is that you not only talked about the benefits that the individuals were seeing, um, yes, our computer lab is highly used but the socialization is really important. And some things that we may miss was brought out in your research when you talked about people and their feeling of stigmatization when they're coming through and there may be an NA or AA group going on. And so I think that that's a, a um, area for professional development, especially those of us that are running RC, uh, RCCs and RCOCs to understand how um, those 12 step groups can impact people that are coming in that may not be participating in those groups. And so that's for future development. Um, and so you hit the gaps right on the head. You talked about the lack of um, racial diversity, and I think that that's really huge, but that's also an area for future expansion of the pilot study, right? How do you bring in other states? How do you bring in 
um, racial diversity. And so that lack of racial diversity could have also contributed to some of the perceptions like an RCC is only for people with lower economic status, right? Because what we're seeing here on the ground, uh, particularly that we uh, serve uh, predominantly black and brown uh, participants, that is not their perception. Their perception is this is home, this is a safe space. Oh my goodness, the fact that I can come and do yoga and meditation and acupuncture in my community, I don't have to go downtown is a blessing. So I would love to see how uh, the addition of, of racial diversity in your study translates in the findings. Um, and so lastly, just in terms of the professional development, we talked about uh, opportunities for um, uh, leaders looking at that AANA piece, but I also think that there are opportunities to enhance the engagement with OTPs and clinics that are serving people with MOUD. And so how do we as you know, leaders and those of us that are running and developing RCCs better engage with um, uh, those agencies. And um, yeah, that's that's the last of my piece. So great job, you knocked it out of the park. Wonderful, thank you, Felicia. And you gave a perfect segue for Amanda, who's up next, uh, who is a prescriber and can tell us more what it feels like on her end. Hi, everyone. Uh, Roxanne, amazing job. You did fantastic. I know presenting is so nerve wracking, but you did a great job. This was an amazing study. Um, and I have to say that I learned quite a lot. So I'm a, I'm a physician at Tufts Medical Center and um, am often starting things like methadone, suboxone in patients who are in acute withdrawal who are admitted to the medical floors. And so my perspective is very different. I will admit to all of you that things like recovery community centers are not something that um, I am familiar with or I was familiar with uh, prior to reviewing this. I had to, I had to Google um, recovery community centers in the Boston area. And I found out that there are several. Um, and even as we are very, as I'm very familiar with, you know, the local AA, NA meetings, um, these, this is a huge, resource gap that we are not educating our patient population on. So that's one thing that I want to comment is that I agree completely with Felicia optimizing those relationships between recovery community centers and the clinical setting where these medications are started um, and kind of maintained and adjusted is going to be key. I mean, we all know addiction as a disease is so alienating and that kind of despair that we see our pa our, our our patients in um is just so it's so palpable and they're so alone. And so that community, the community aspect of recovery is so key. Um and so I am often, you know, spouting off about, you know, hey, Try to go to a meeting. You don't like AA, go to NA. If you don't like NA, go to Smart Recovery. Something where you are with other people who are facing this disease together, um, because that's that's such an important part of kind of that intrinsic motivation to keep going to get that mutual support. And so I feel a little bit, you know, a little bit silly, a little bit underprepared that I. I was not aware of this um, amazing resource in the community. So I definitely agree that, you know, reaching out to people in the hospital or hospital staff in the local area would be um, a great way to engage more individuals who are on MOUT. Wonderful. And I'm definitely going to circle back for all of us to you know, talk more about what has worked for outreach and what things we can do and to just kind of like chew on that a little bit. I first want to make sure we cycle in Kathy as well. Kathy is also from uh, Rhode Island and has uh, the viewpoint of a policymaker where she is involved in the Rhode Island Governor's Task Force to address the opioid overdose crisis. Kathy, what are your takeaways and thoughts? Um, so I think that, well, just to clarify, so I'm a person in long-term recovery, um, and I'm that first before I'm ever a policymaker, and I'm not trying to correct you, but I just need that to be very clear. So everything I come um, at this conversation is always rooted in my recovery and my recovery process and how I feel when I walk into a recovery center um, and what Roxanne's results were um, and, and, and really reflecting on that. 
So the things that stood out the most to me is because I think about um, how how I feel, right? When I walk into when Anchor first started, Anchor didn't exist when I first came into uh, recovery. Um, it really was just 12 steps. Um, and so there were actually 12 step meetings that were um, uh, more welcoming to people that were like still struggling and, and using drugs um, when I came in, but they were actually, it was actually an AA meeting um, and anybody from Rhode Island, if you all remember putting in the streets, it saved my life, right? Because it was a place to go even when I was just still really um, not ready yet. Um, and so that's how I see uh, recovery community centers. But I do think it's really important that we, um, for me, and what I focus on the most is the um, perception of people who are in MOUDs when they walk into a recovery community center and there's an AA or an NA meeting happening and how they feel there, there's that um, uh, motion of the two different things and people not understanding that a recovery community center is about all pathways to recovery and that 12 steps is just one of the pathways to recovery. And you really did such a great job, Roxanne, on really capturing that. Um, we've talked a million times and we already knew this. Um, <laughs> um, and I think that like, I think about the way that a building is set up is like one of the ways that really could make a huge impact on how that is portrayed. Um, if a building is set up in a way where you have different pathways to recovery in different rooms that maybe isn't when you walk right in the door, um, it might be perceived differently. Um, you know, if it's at different times of the day um, and it isn't as focused on, you know, how many people are walking in the door um, for a recovery community center. And it's more about um, the quality of, of what they're walking into the recovery community center um, is. I think that those are the kinds of things that, um, that really stand out. And this research showed that. Um, it really showed um, that it isn't the recovery community centers itself that are stigmatizing, but that is not what the people that are on MOUDs feel. And, you know, I, I do want to say this, you can, you know, I have a little bit of letters from my name. I'm not a doctor, I'm not trying to be either. Roxanne is, that's Roxanne, she can do that. Um, <laughs> and we're very close by the way, can you tell? Um, but the reality is, is that um, I do have some education, but at the end of the day, like, even if I had absolutely no education, I'm still an expert in um, recovery and addiction because I'm a person with lived experience and I lived it. But it's changed. The landscape has changed and there needs to be some newer people that come and they come and they bring their perspective of what's happening out there. So I'm so grateful uh, for this study and I'm grateful that it was conducted by a person with lived experience um, because I think that that makes a huge difference too. I don't think we would have got the same result if it hadn't been run in their team. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. And just opening it up to, to all of you about your thoughts and reactions. I think I saw a comment coming in from Joe. Joe, if you're comfortable to, to share your experiences in Florida, if not, I can also read out the quote. Sure, yeah, thank you. I uh, was uh, fortunate enough to uh, help one of the uh, our RCC start in Orlando and we were all most most of us were people in long-term recovery and we were we invited the 12-step communities as was uh, smart recovery celebrate recovery uh, refuge recovery all recovery meetings uh, Mars meetings so we, we uh, offered a full menu of uh, opportunities for people to respect the multiple pathways but we found that when we engaged with the community and brought folks in from the 12-step community, specifically the uh, Public Relations Committee. If you reach out to them, they will come and meet with you privately and you can explain what you're doing there and that they can go back to the individual groups and, and ask them to be sensitive uh, when folks come in and, and take the risk of sharing that they may be on a MAT or a Mars program and you know that the folks would help to uh, welcome them and, and be a part of. It, it seemed to me like most of that was open and uh, it, it worked well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. And circling back um, to, to the, oh, actually I'll go ahead for Shasta first. If you go right ahead. 
I know whenever I'm in Pennsylvania, um, near Pittsburgh, and we just opened up, it's a couple years now, two years, three, two years, um, Recovery Capital was our recovery community center. And the one thing that I was adamant about was not making it another meeting house. Um, those are already existing in the community and those 12 step meetings are already existing in the community. So I was very against bringing any of that in house to undo a what's already been existing. Heaven forbid my center close. Now, what are they all going to do? And B, to just offer something different. So we are not very meeting focused at all at our center. We have one meeting every day from three to four. It's called an all recovery meeting um, where that allows people from all different addictions and all different medications or whatever to just come together and talk about that. The most, mostly what we focus on is, is the socialization and the networking with different calendar activities and, you know, gym workout groups and pool tournaments and stuff like that, that real socialization um, of just meeting those new people, places and figuring out new things that everybody says so much. Um, you know, the meetings I think are the meetings that are always going to be there. They've been there for you know, a hundred years almost. So they're, they're going to keep doing their thing and they're going to figure it out. I just didn't see our house as another platform to recreate the wheel of stuff that was already existing. Great. Thank you. And it looks like Vesley has a common response. Go right ahead, Wesley. <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. Uh, I really appreciate this uh, presentation. I'm from Florida, uh, and so I was particularly fascinated uh, with the lower prevalence and use among individuals on Medicaid assisted uh, recovery uh, and utilizing that modality. Um, that was just really fascinating to me, and, and I started to maybe get into the weeds and, and thinking a little bit about it, and, you know, perhaps the why and wondering if it may be attributed to uh, that treatment modality alleviating the painful symptoms and craving, uh, which can also be really acute uh, in, in need for alleviating uh, those symptoms. Uh, and so if whether or not we, uh, you know, trying to in um, uh, trying to promote the utilization of RCTs, uh, you know, to help individuals sustain wellness and recovery. Uh, if there's a need to improve the messaging on the importance of more holistic type approach and how that can help a person sustain whole health. Um, you know, because if, if a person is, you know, withdrawing, having, uh, you know, symptom craving and so forth, that is uh, much more acute. Uh, and so, you know, if, if those are alleviated through that type of modality, uh, then maybe that creates a sense of I am then recovered, which is fine if that's the person's definition of recovery. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, what me, what we as you know, uh, champions of our CCs might be able to do to, uh, if it is even the goal, to increase the utilization of our CCs among that uh, uh, population or that demographic. Um, and and two, um, sorry, I've got a couple of points. Um, I'm just fascinated with it here. In your in one of your key takeaways, um, you highlighted uh, the. Uh, utilization of sort of those ancillary type supportive services, uh, computers, employment, you know, the supportive uh, type services to help a person in recovery. Um, and, um, you know, um, I wonder if, you know, and, and to the point about, you know, not just being uh, not just having an RCC be a, a, another, you know, group gathering place uh, and looking to expand the menu of options, uh, you know, if, if there may be some opportunity to really uh, assist RCCs in, in focusing on expansion and uh, of menu of options of support. Because at this point, with your takeaway, that seems to be a, a, a really good key indicator of what is valued uh, among the uh, the control group or the uh, population that you survey. Just thoughts. 
wonderful and that echoes also to Nashasa what she said about the extra value, right? Roxanne, right. go right ahead. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I could comment. I was like, of course, um, you can jump in all the time. This is your presentation. Don't, please don't <laughs> let me not talk. I'll like burst right in front of everybody. Um, so I really like Shasta. I really like how you um, had brought that up and not make it another club space. I think that like historically, right, like for many years, we were told to hide in church basements. Like even today, even though like, we, I think we're getting better. Even today, like at this moment, I still get, can feel the stigma, whether in different areas that I'm in. I'm just, um, I'm very open about my recovery because I just don't really care if anyone doesn't like me or holds back an opportunity or doesn't want to hang out with me um, because I lived for so long with internal shame of who I am and still battle some of that. But like that part of me doesn't really care anymore. But like for a long time, like we hit on these basements, right? So I know that when Anchor came along and I'm so glad Ian's here. Hi, Ian, um, that he can help me. When I, so I first came into our CC space, I had um, 90 days in recovery. And this was the beginning of it in Rhode Island, really those first like 2010, 2012, like beginning years. And what happened was, is that we were getting our funding, but in order to get it, like we really needed to show like people were using this space, right? So the easiest way to grab people who are in recovery to get this money, because this is about money, like we have this costs money to run these, right? We anchor had huge NA and AA fellowships. So we would now while fellowships are autonomous, anonymous, and we don't have to claim that we were there. We don't even have to say our name in a meeting. We can literally go in the meeting, sit there and never speak again. And, and I say we, because I'm a I'm part of a fellowship of a fellowship, but like we can sit down. But we would sweat, but what would happen was Anchor would be like, we were so excited to be there and to have our own little space that we had these key tags and we would go through and we would swipe. So while people understood the connection between the brain and all, what was going on was I'm walking in this space, I'm going to meeting, let me swipe my key tag. So now as time has gone on and Shasta has pointed out, maybe some of the things that need to could happen is us being able to detach not so central focused on any in AA space with people that are, are towards that pathway. But the reality is if RCCs really believe in all pathways to recovery, we have to figure out a way to make it so that both of them can live together because it's not fair to say, oh, you know, I mean, like, it's not fair to swing from one side or the other, where we go from all the way to 12 steps fellowship and, and then swing over here and say, we're not going to do this at all. It's somewhere, and we tend to do that as humans. I know I do that in a lot of areas in society, right? So like to be able to find this middle ground, but I do like what you brought up, Shasta, about making it, trying to detach a little bit and is in, and Kathy brought this up, like how your space is set up where we're able to show that like, if you like this, it, you know, if this is something that you enjoy, then you can go and this is where this, you know, NA meets in this room or AA meets in this room, but the other, the rest is going on over here is this different pathway. So I think that that's for in Rhode Island from my own lived experience, like just kind of all of like, really, that's really where the information is coming from, to be honest, is that, that was really what was going on in this space at the time. Wonderful. Felicia? Thank you. Um, both Roxanne and Wesley sparked a couple of things for me. Um, here in Harlem, the way that the interaction and integration or lack thereof between the RCOC participants and the 12-step participants is happening is actually in reverse. And so what I mean by that is that some of the principles of AA and NA you know, not being affiliated with any organization, sect, denomination, institution, keeps them very separate and in the room and no, I can't engage out there. And that and that's interesting. <laughs> I see uh, Shasta's uh, uh, reaction to that. And so that's really interesting to me because I find that I have to either catch people right before the meeting starts or right after the meeting happens to go, Oh, and by the way, we have all of these other ways that you can enhance your recovery. So I wanted to say that. So it's not that the people coming into the RCOC don't want to participate in the 12-step meetings, but it's the other way around. 
Um, the other thing that, that Wesley said that really sparked for me, and a lot of my research is rooted in understanding um, how the attainment of recovery capital really uh, um, uh, is impacted by some political determinants of health for people of color, um, is, is, is that as someone who's founded an RCOC, I knew that recovery is deeply personal. And so what worked for me and what I am an expert in is really only what works for me and what I am an expert in for me. And what was pivotal for the success of this uh, RCOC that we are in, the pillars, which I will say is the highest performing RCOC of all downstate New York, is that it was the voices from the ground up that built the house. And so the foundation was, how do I go to the community, understand what the community's needs were before I began to put the pieces in place? And that was that was critical um, in terms of the expansion, which Wesley was talking about. This is the last thing I'm going to say, Kathy, because I want to pass the mic to you as well, um, it, is that, you know, the social, you know, physical, cultural, human capital, those are the things that offered the opportunities for more people to participate because one person might want to become re-engaged with their family member and that is their, you know, foundation for their recovery and somebody else might want to gain their physical health, their emotional health, their psychological health. So it is not for me to determine, but for me to be able to offer enough services that tap into many different facets of recovery for many different individuals. Thank you. Kathy. I'm going to make it quick. I, I mean, thank you so much. Um, um, so, uh, Felicia, there you are. <laughs> um, so thank you for that, because that's kind of like where I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the, the role of the recovery community centers is to build recovery capital. And recovery capital is very personal and it looks very different for each person. So having all of those levels and all of those type of resources is what is necessary. Um, and also being very understanding of all of those different things. So I had opened um, a very non-traditional recovery center, which was not actually a recovery center. I was with what's called the health equity zones here in Rhode Island. And there was a hub space um, and it was West Warwick, for those of you who know, West Warwick had an actual free community space. Um, and in that, I wanted it to be a drop. I wanted it to be a recovery center. Jim Gillen's vision, he picked the paint out and everything. It was supposed to be a pop-up recovery center. And they tried, but they didn't have the right people running it originally. When, and I, this is when I was working at Anchor. But then I ended up the manager of this space. And so what I did was um, I couldn't, I, 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 I would have had to um, hire somebody to be there, to just be there for the space and to be the coordinator. So what I did instead is I literally kind of did what... Um, Somebody was saying that they did. Am I, am I uh, Shasta? Am I saying your name right? I'm terrible at pronouncing people's names. Um, what what I did instead was I actually had um, I I just like asked the community what they wanted, and we had resident amb ambassadors who said, "Well, we want to hold an all recovery meeting," and like they, I let them they well I helped them to lead it, and it actually didn't work. It's not really what the community wanted. It was what one person wanted. It was fine it was all free right um and i was able to give some stipends to residents um but we also had a lot of um you know um we had a lot of transgender folks that needed yoga and they wanted a safe place to do that and they wanted to do that that by themselves not with the general public so it was closed for just those folks smart recovery came and they were having meetings um, on a regular basis aa came in and they had meetings on a regular basis but what we did was we tiered it so that they weren't together at the same time. Um, everywhere is different. This was not a recovery center, but it was also set up so that there were two separate conference rooms. So I go back to what I said earlier, is I don't think this is an or, this is an and, and it's based on what the community wants and what the community looks like. If you have a lot of AA and NA meetings in your community, they're already there, maybe you don't need that. Um, and I, I don't know, and Ian, you might know this, but like I know from old school because I was in the church basements and I'm actually glad that I was. That's for me. That's my recovery process. There was so much stigma. Recovery movement didn't exist yet and it was not vocal. And if it was, it was very rare. Um, and it saved my life. So that's just my story. But when I share with other people, I just want to help build recovery capital. 
But my understanding of in Rhode Island, what Anchor really was originally was supposed to be a clubhouse. That was actual vision um, when um, it was first opened, was to be able to have a place to have meetings throughout the day because there were none. Um, and whether it was A or NA, I don't care. That doesn't matter. But there wasn't anything through the day, during the day for any, any, and a place for anybody to go. So that's what I see the Recovery Community Center as being, is a place during the day where people can go. And whether you flex your hours, doesn't matter if it's 12 steps, doesn't matter if it's yoga. I love yoga too. You know what I mean? That saved my life too. So, you know, I'm complex. I have to have it all. And I don't know about everybody else, but I'm going to give you time to speak also in Natalia and Ben. Sorry. Thank you, Kathy. Ben? Thanks, Bettina. Uh, Roxanne, great job. If you hadn't had uh, told us that you were nervous, I would have never known. So <laughs> excellent, excellent delivery, excellent presentation, and um, love the topic. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to, to get some more of your thoughts uh, in, in terms of the issue of selective disclosure that you mentioned. Um, what, what were some of your observations and uh, what do you think some of the challenges are around in terms of what that, um, in terms of how to research that? Like what challenges does that present for research? Ben, why do you have to <laughs> put me right on the spot, dude? Uh, um, so yeah, I mean, I definitely think people are, were apprehensive about sharing that, you know, there was definitely multiple participants talking about, I don't really talk about it. Um, that I'm on MOUD and that you could definitely get a sense that it was like, you know, stigma um, that they felt like. Um, but I think that definitely like getting understand people's reasons why they share and why they don't share is a real, I don't know if there's any research like that out there, but kind of going out there because I do think sometimes too, if I can just like say something like if medication is not a big deal, like big deal if being on MOUD should not be a focus then there seems to be a push to say oh I'm on in recovery MOUD like I don't say I'm in recovery narcotics anonymous I just say I'm in recovery so there always seems and it could be just because research right we want to know this this subset this population what's going on there it could be because like the stigma does exist it's like we need to address it like um, it could be because, you know, people feel ashamed and guilty and people do drastic things. Like, I mean, I have people tell me I'm going to stop taking my medication. I'm like, no, 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 no. We don't do that. We do not jump off methadone. That is a big no, no. Um, you know, we wait until we're stabilized. We do it with a doctor. So some of that, I think, too, is like kind of understanding why people disclose, why people don't disclose, and what is the importance of disclosure? Is that necessary? Is that something that we like, because it, it's people do, they just like, it's like every time I, well, you know, but I'm on methadone. Well, you know, well, I'm on Suboxone. I don't go and tell you guys if I take a multivitamin every morning or if I take something for my mental health. I don't. I don't say that is, would that be part of my recovery? Absolutely. If I have to take a medication to make sure that I'm feeling better because my serotonin doesn't go, rise enough or my dopamine's all messed up because I got ADHD or whatever, I don't go and tell everybody that. So I think that that may be like some of one, one of the ways to go is to understand what's the real reason and is it really that important to disclose? Thank you. And before I go to Natalie, Brandon, you had your hand up earlier. Did you want to jump in and ask a question or make a comment? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> thank you. I was actually going to type it out and give folks another chance, but <clears throat> I can ask the question. So um, uh, first of all, Roxanne, great job. I, the qualitative data piece really does give uh, like ri very rich insights into the perspectives of folks taking medications and who in, or who may or may not be using RCCs. Um, but so... Um, Dr. Von Horn, Amanda, you mentioned not really even being familiar with RCCs. Um, that, 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 that stood out to me. I'm sure you're not, I'm sure you're not the only one. So I'm kind of wondering, Amanda, if you have thoughts, Roxanne, uh, Felicia, Kathy, any of the, the speakers, I'm thinking about potential solutions, right? Like in terms of in the future, ways to enhance connections and linkages between 
uh, prescribers of OUD medications and RCC. So, but in terms of informing those solutions, I'm wondering like, what do you think accounts potentially for that disconnect? And then kind of part B is, is that different for folks who are buprenorphine prescribers, like in the community or in office-based settings versus methadone programs where people are getting methadone via OTPs and the differences in those two ways of receiving OUD medications. But yeah, it's sort of fundamentally like, what do we think accounts for that disconnect? Um, again, Amanda, your, it was your comment that raised that question for me, but anyway, that has insights here. would love to hear them. Yeah, so what accounts for that disconnect? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, <laughs> I know that, you know, uh, the hospital staff is often like, we're approached, like we have pharma representatives coming in saying, hey, prescribe this medication, it treats X, Y, Z, it works like this. And, you know, we don't have, I mean, we often are also approached by different inpatient residential services. Hey, just so you know, this might be a good referral source, you might be a good referral source for our um our inpatient uh, residential center for treatment. And that's great. So I have not personally, and I can only speak from my personal experience, I have not personally been approached or have received any kind of information about these recovery uh, community centers. And they would be very, very welcome because these are accessible by people in the community. Um, they don't cost anything. They don't need insurance coverage. They don't have all of these other barriers that so many of our patients have. Um, yeah, and just one thing to comment on, and then other folks have insights. So the diff, like the one variable to me that differentiates residential treatment programs and pharmaceutical companies or drug reps or whatever from RTCs is the 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 former are are money making institutions, whereas RTCs are not. So they don't really have as much of a financial incentive. You know, Robert just but hashtag money exactly. Exactly. So I think that's an important variable, but but outreach is what you, sorry, I just wanted to point that out and I'll stop. <laughs> but I definitely Thank want to make sure we yeah. get to Natalie and Ian, but we know you're a prescriber in the room as well. Are you responding directly to this conversation as well? Yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, I, well, it's true that um, a lot of the institutions that like, like uh, prescription drug companies do sometimes um, or like rehabs try to get um, the medical community's attention through money. AA and NA haven't. They just have a history. Um, and they have a lot of patients coming in and teaching us about um, how it's been um, helpful in their process. And there has been academic um, contributions as much as it could be. But um, there are places where the medical community common goes to to learn about uh, to learn about this. I think one of the great parts of this uh, um, this group in this undertaking is to develop that science so that um, one of the benefits being that the medical community will learn more about RCCs, um, but that will be slow. Um, but I admit I'm a medical director of a substance use clinic, and I didn't really know about recovery community centers until shortly I became involved, shortly before I became involved with this group. Um, and it's just really opening up my eyes about like how much recovery-oriented work is going on out there that and how many untapped resources there are. But if there aren't incentives to talk to each other, the increasing presence of recovery coaches within medical um, clinics has been really invaluable in terms of promulgating this idea of recovery community centers can be really valuable. So I think these are some of the things that will help move this in the direction that we need to be going. Um, I'll just stop there. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, we are at the hour. We're going to go Natalie next. I just want to let you all know that we are going to continue this conversation for the next half hour. Um, and all the presenters have uh, said that it would take the time. So we will keep going. Both of, us, both of you who do have to go, we really appreciate you being here, sharing your thoughts, thinking through this. If anything comes to mind, as always, send an email our way, set up a Zoom call. We're always happy to hear from you and chat with you. Natalie. Yeah, thank you. I am going to have to get off after this, so I'm sorry I have another one to go on, but I, I just want to give a perspective from uh, Northwest Illinois, very rural, uh, five years ago, not knowing about RCOs or RCCs, uh, we just started this, a champion that was in the community, we began talking, and we started talking about how do we reach out and do these types of things, and 
we didn't have a space. We just did it. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm a family re ally. And, and then uh, I um, hooked in with people in the community that I had worked with that are in recovery. And we just called a meeting together and got it going. A year later, we did get some funds from the state for an organization. Um, and we still, in the last three years, we've changed locations three times. Never have have we had a, a place where people come in and do things. So all of ours is really out in the community connecting with the YMCA. We have running groups that meet at the Y and basketball groups on Saturday. And we have a church in town that uh, we have an art in recovery and they meet every Tuesday. So we have a whole schedule, but it's really not at one particular site. And so we've needed to, you know, use um, where everyone goes, you know, for, for socialization and exercise and education and all of that. Um, and I think that can work as long as you collaborate and, and cooperate with everyone. Our next step is really looking at stigma in the community, uh, but having stronger groups and people in the community really helps to normalize that also. So I appreciate the conversation. I love the research also, uh, and uh, I'll hear from you all later. Thanks. Great, thank you, Natalie. Big thank you to everybody here, especially our presenter, Roxanne. Wonderful presentation, Felicia, Felicia, Amanda, and Kathy. Thank you for still being here and for the great conversation you're facilitating. I just want to make sure I say that because without you, we wouldn't be here right now. Thank you all. Felicia, you had another comment. Yeah, I do. Um, Bettina, first, I want to really thank you for bringing us all together because without this platform, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to hear comments like Brandon's and like Amanda's um, about the um, the lack of information that we have given to the community that we're here, our COCs are here. And so I'm gonna take some responsibility for that. Um, and, and I think it's surprising because we are state and federally funded. So my thought is, well, everybody knows about our COCs, but I'm learning that that's not true. Um, the other thing I, I, I want to do, uh, Brandon, is really speak directly to your question about um, what's happening and the whys around some of that. Great. In New York State, there uh, was an attempt about maybe about three years ago. I, I have COVID time frame in my head, so I can't always connect pre-COVID and post-COVID and how much how many years have happened in between then. Um, not that we're post COVID. Okay. But I digress. Um, <laughs> I, 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 um, they, they attempted to do what was called a regional response grant. Right. And so the regional response was putting the RCOCs at the hub and then connecting treatment and recovery around it. And I think theoretically it was a great, uh, idea. However, the translation and the execution not so much because someone put in the chat hashtag money. There is this uh, um, uh, idea that if someone goes from an OTP to a recovery center and they like one better than the other, there is no return back to the OTP or to treatment or to any other prescriber where Medicaid is being billed. And therefore there is this, uh, this propensity to hold on to the client in a way that may not be as helpful for the client as to expand the opportunity for services, right? Um, and so we have to be really uh, conscientious about that and understand that, you know, we, when we talk about expanding opportunities, 